you are in the middle of a psychological study. Which line, one or two or three, is equal in length to the line on the left? Watch this man. His eyes, like yours, tell him that line three is the correct answer. Up to this point, the rest of the group has been told to make the obvious right choice. But now, unknown to him, they have been instructed to give the wrong answer and by their unanimity to pressure him to conform. Will this man conform to the group's incorrect judgment or will he stick to the evidence of his own eyes? Will he say line three? Line one. This demonstration, based on pioneering studies by Solomon Ash and comparable ones by Muzaffar Sharif and others, deals with the great need to conform and the ways that individuals and groups react to that need. This is a most important area of research in the field of social psychology. I'm John Darley. Our concern here is with social psychology, the relations between individuals and the many groups to which they belong, and the pressure each exerts on the other. All psychologists seek to understand how we think, how we feel, how we develop, and learn to cope with our complex world. The primary area of investigation for the social psychologist is man's behavior in groups. For man does not live in isolation. He is clearly a social animal. He works in groups. He plays in groups. He often achieves community action and progress in groups. And his groups are often in conflict with each other. In the course of his development, the group will influence him, and he in turn may influence it. But if the world is the source material for the social psychologist, how can he scale his investigations down to reasonable size? What the social psychologist does is to isolate one small aspect of the problem, separate it from the complications of everyday life, and study that aspect under controlled laboratory conditions. No single experiment is meant to solve all social problems, but each experiment may add a little bit to our store of knowledge. Engaged in this kind of work is Dr. Stanley Schachter of Columbia University. A few minutes from now, five students are going to be sitting in these empty chairs behind me. They've never seen these two boys before, but after just a very few minutes of conversation, they're going to turn on this one. And they're going to start arguing with him, and they'll argue more and more violently, perhaps, and eventually, probably, they'll simply reject him. Why? He's obviously a perfectly pleasant, reasonable-looking sort of fellow. His single failing, he refuses to conform. Now, you saw in the Ash experiment the kinds of pressures the group could exert on the individual in order to make conform. Let's see in this one what happens to the individual, what the group does to him, when he refuses to conform. In order to facilitate this kind of discussion, what I've done is to... In a moment, the group will be discussing the case of Johnny Rocco, and this is a fictitious name for a wildly troubled, almost hopelessly confused 12-year-old kid. Johnny's been in trouble with the police for years, and right now he's in detention. Here's a seven-point scale of alternatives as to what the judge should do with him, and they range, as you see, from point one all love and kindness, all the way down to point seven, saying, in effect, the kid is hopeless, discipline him severely. Now, let's simply start off, say, with you, sir, and get your present opinion, what you feel should actually be done with this kid. And why don't you then just tell us which point on the scale you feel is the most sensible treatment the kid can have at present. I feel point number four is the best, the one with equal amounts of love and discipline. Okay, and you, sir? I think point number three, emphasizing more love. 
<clears throat> I think number two, emphasizing even more love. Mm -hmm. I tend to agree with the other gentleman. Number two, emphasizing more love. Mm -hmm. um, I think number seven would be the best uh, program in this case. And discipline is what he needs. I see. Yes, sir. Uh, definitely number two, uh, emphasis on the love and affection. I think everybody, too, is right. I'm, I'm on two also. Now, uh, let me then throw the floor open to you. Really, we're interested in your opinions on this. And please don't talk to me. Just uh, talk to one another about this issue, if you don't mind. OK? It's yours. Well, it seems to me that we have these alternatives of either smothering him with kindness or punishing him when he does something wrong. Now, one of these has been tried in the past, and now uh, I think it's time to try the, the other alternative, which is um, punishing him or disciplining him when he does something wrong. He's very sensitive to how you treat him. The fault is that Johnny's only, what, 13, I don't know, 12 or 13. Uh, I have a brother about the same age, and uh, it would alienate him completely, I think, to uh, take away all the love. He's a young fella. He's got a lot to learn, and he, I'm sure that he'd react, uh, respond quite favorably to uh, any love and affection that he got. I think he wants to be treated fairly. I don't, I don't think he, because he has the experience of knowing people who were treated with more love than discipline. Maybe he was envious of them. I don't think he would want that situation. You're talking about what Johnny would want, but there's another question here, and that is what society needs, that uh, Johnny affects our other people. Now remember, the nonconformer is my assistant. He's been trained to take this position. He's a perfectly nice boy, and he's making a plausible defense of his position. His only sin is that he disagrees with them. I think it's important that, uh, that, that these people be um, kept out of society, trained not to not to do this sort of thing. I, I can see if he's uh, 30 years old and you know and rob jewelry stores and uh, is this way, but a 12-year-old kid, <coughs> I mean, he's still a baby. You know, you should give him a chance and uh, let him get some uh, some love and affection that he hasn't had yet. Yeah, uh, but if you're a jewelry store owner, it doesn't make too much difference years old. to you. I mean, whether the guy who steals your, your, your jewels is 12 or 30 or 70 or 110. Well, how do you think <laughs> society has been, was, been against him all this time? Well, so that you think that he has a right to get back at society? No, I'm not asking you so. to get back at them, but that's a, it's society's well, you want to let them uh, lose. duty to do something to try to really rehabilitate people like this. I think you're, that, you're, I think you're making a false division here. Uh, you said we're interested in Johnny and, and not interested in society. Well. As far as our interest goes to Johnny, we, we want to see him become a successful member of society. We're feeling that, that in this way, we do something for Johnny. This is our, our whole context of what we operate in, in for Johnny. Because we want to help him. And the way we want to help him is we want to integrate him into society. It seems to me your whole philosophy yeah. revolves around punishment being uh, a much better means of getting people to learn yeah, than rewarding cool. them and Definitely giving them positive. The but this is not really a case where we need to uh, get Johnny to learn, we need to get him to unlearn. He's already learned to break in, he knows how to break into jewelry stores. It seems to me that if we start rewarding Johnny in his present position, all this will mean is that he's being rewarded for everything that he's done in his life, most of which... No, well, that's not what at you all. Take him out that's of what I'm saying. You're forgetting the fact that this can be done consistently when it's necessary and when, uh, when it seems that he's done something deserving of reward, then he's... he's uh, rewarded, but at the same time, doesn't mean that he's going to be rewarded for everything he's done. There are times when he has to be punished, too. I don't think any of us feel that uh, he should no longer be punished at all. Yeah, well, I don't think that number two says that. Number two says yeah. that you put him in surrounding where the... The group is taking a stronger and stronger position against the deviant. Remember, we're measuring the extent to which the group rejects a nonconformer. It's going to be time soon to ask for another vote, and then we'll conclude the discussion have equal love and equal punishment. It's just, you know, an idealistic situation. Mm -hmm. A little bit more love. Just maybe for, a, maybe the first year he's in this new family, a little bit more than he would normally get. Just to, like, you know, get him back in uh, where he's feeling that, uh, you know, people are capable of love and he, and then he can find out too that he, he's capable of love. But in any case, I think, you know, it can be a little bit more and four, not seven. Uh, that, that to me doesn't make any sense. You're talking, you're talking when he was thinking. Fellas, I hate to interrupt, but time's running out. And I, for my purpose, if you don't mind, I'd like a final census just to know how everybody feels right now. How about you? I think point number four would be the best taken. The one with e equal love and equal discipline. 
Mm-hmm. And you, Bill? I think number three, the one with slightly more love. And Mr. Atkins? I think number two, with more emphasis on love. Mm-hmm. Herb hasn't convinced me yet, too. <laughs> two. And Bill? I believe in number seven. Uh, You're still seven. Still. Okay. I'll remain with the emphasis on love and affection. That's two? Yes, sir. You're still two. And Phil, where are two. you? Two. Two. Good. Well, thanks, all of you. <laughs> now, look, uh, we're going to have a couple of problems. I know all of you want to keep on as members of this kind of discussion group, which you all told me earlier. Uh, now, since we have awfully complicated case material to go over in the future in this kind of discussion, this number of people is just going to turn out to be a little bit unwieldy and clumsy to handle this kind of thing. And uh, we found that probably the best number for this kind of thing is about five people. Now, I don't want to choose who the five should be, obviously. I'll give you each a sheet of paper, write your own name, and uh, then write down the four people in the group whom you would most like to to have with you in your own discussion group, okay? I'm sure that you'd like to know how the subjects felt about uh, our non-conformer here. And uh, here are the results on their slips of the five real subjects. Apparently not a single one wanted uh, Bib, who was the non-conformer in the same group with them for future discussions. As a matter of fact, uh, though they weren't asked to, two of the boys deliberately wrote, made a point of writing on their slips, not Bib. Well, in this experiment, as you've just seen, the non-conformer is rejected. Fairly rough and unpleasant treatment all around, isn't it? Unpleasant enough, I suspect, so that many of us in a similar spot will conform and will actually say things in which we don't genuinely believe. Now, what is it that happens to someone who does say something in which he doesn't really believe? And it's on precisely this problem that Dr. Leon Festinger of Stanford University is working at present. When people are forced to say something they don't believe, a strange thing happens. They begin to believe what they are saying. Now, this isn't easy to understand. It doesn't fit common sense. But dissonance theory can help us to explain it. According to the dictionary, dissonant means harsh, inharmonious, jarring, grating. Now, two thoughts can also grate and then we are in a state of dissonance. Dissonance is a tension-producing drive which, like hunger, has to be reduced. The only way we can reduce the dissonance between these two discrepant thoughts is to change one or the other. If you can't change your behavior, then you change your opinions. Now let me demonstrate the kind of laboratory experiment that we have done to test this. Each subject's assignment, to turn each of the wooden pegs a quarter turn to the right, then to start over and turn them again, and again, and again, until the experimenter tells him to stop. It is the most boring and fatiguing task we could devise. Our purpose was to provide each subject with the same dull job, so each would have a similar negative experience. In order to obtain the scientific data we need, we use a little subterfuge and say we're studying motor performance. Afterward, they will be told the truth. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Let me tell you now what we're actually studying here. It's the effect of preparatory mental set on performance. Half of the subjects are doing the job uh, cold, just as you did. The rest of the subjects are prepared by being told that the experiment will be very interesting and enjoyable. In fact, lots of fun. Uh, Now I have a somewhat unusual request to make of you. Uh, The next subject is waiting right outside, but the fellow who ordinarily gives the spiel uh, isn't here. Uh, I wonder if you could possibly take his place. As a matter of fact, we figure we'll be needing someone in the future, so I'd like to offer you a $20 retainer and have you remain on call for us. Uh, Would that be all right? $20? That'd be fine. We'd like to give you a dollar as a sort of a retainer and have you remain on call with us. Would that be all right with you? Yes, that'll be all right. So we'd like to offer you a retainer of $20. We divide the group. Half will get $20 to tell someone the dull task is interesting. The other half get $1 for the same job. 
They all agreed to tell an obvious lie. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next subject is waiting right outside. In reality, the subject meets one of our assistants, trained to get them to publicly commit themselves to this untruth. They gave us some pegs to turn and, uh, well, I turned them for a while and it was a lot of fun. It was sort of interesting, I guess. Really? Well, that's strange because a friend of mine took the experiment last week. I think it was the same experiment and uh, he said it was pretty miserable and that I should do everything I could to uh, get out of it. Well, I think maybe your friend was wrong. Perhaps it was a different experiment because this was a lot of fun. It, it appeared to me as if, a, for, as if it were a puzzle. We you know, had to turn these knobs and I tried to figure out what we were doing it for, but I really couldn't figure it out. Perhaps you'll have better luck. Well, what do you have to do exactly? Well, we turned pegs and knobs the same way each time. And that's about what it was, but it was very interesting. Do you try to find Notice, a solution of any kind? Notice, the $1 subject well, yeah, sells just as hard as the $20 one. But which of them will come to believe know, what they are saying? But I thought it was very interesting. Is it really? Because I was speaking to a girlfriend of mine who participated in an experiment last week, and she said it was very tedious. Oh, I don't think that was the same experiment, because this one wasn't boring at all. I didn't think so. Other theories might predict that the man who was paid most would have the highest motivation for enthusing over the dull task and would be most sold on it himself. Cognitive dissonance theory leads to an exactly opposite prediction. The man who is paid $20 knows that the task is dull, but he also knows that he had sufficient justification for saying that it wasn't. How much did you learn from this experiment? Learn? Well, I don't think I learned too much from the experiment. Did you enjoy working on the manual task? Well, it uh, really wasn't too enjoyable. In fact, it was rather boring. How about the man who is paid one dollar? He knows the task is dull, but he has two discrepant thoughts. He also knows that he did not have sufficient justification for saying that it wasn't. For him, there is dissonance. Time after time, we have seen what follows. He reduces the dissonance by changing his opinion about the dullness of the task. Tell me, how much did you learn from this experiment? Well, at first I don't think I was learning it too much, but when I got into it, I think it was quite interesting, and after a while it got better. Did you enjoy working on the manual task? Yes, I enjoyed it. Would you like to participate in such an experiment again? Yes, I think I would like to. You've seen that if dissonance is created, it must be reduced. This effect doesn't depend on money. Any time there is insufficient reward, there will be dissonance. The general principle seems to be that people come to believe in and to love the things they have to suffer for. The reduction of dissonance in action. How many times have you had a change of opinion in comparable situations? But this is just one of the ways in which interactions with others may change us. Seldom is a man entirely a lone wolf, as was required in the situations we have been watching. We are almost never a minority of one. More frequently, we are caught up in situations that involve competition or cooperation between groups. Can group conflicts always be resolved by compromise or bargaining, leading to a solution of the conflict? Dr. Morton Deutsch of the Bell Telephone Laboratories is investigating that question. Competition, cooperation, these are the elements of any bargaining situation. What determines which will prevail? We think that threat is an important determining factor. In our laboratory, we've set up an experiment to investigate the effect of threat upon bargaining. Mr. Krauss will show you what this experiment is like. The object of this game is to make money. We'd like you to imagine that you are the head of the Acme Trucking Company and your opponent is the head of the Bull Trucking Company. Your companies operate on this highway system. Each of you has a main route and a longer alternate route, which if taken always results in a loss of money. 
Using the switches on your panel, you can control the movement of your truck. You can either go forward or reverse. Your big problem is this one lane section in the middle on which only one truck can pass at a time. For every trip you complete, you get 60 cents minus operating expenses, which are figured at the rate of one cent a second. You can see that time is money, and the quicker you reach your destination, the more your profit will be. OK? So let's get set. Go. The trucks meet head on on the one lane road, and the issue is joined. Acme tries a bluff toward the alternate route then returns to wait it out. Bolt decides then to break the deadlock. He reverses. Let's act me through. Then goes on himself to his destination. On that trip, Acme won 27 cents. Bolt won 11 cents. OK, ready? Go. A game consists of 20 trials. By the 10th trial, both players have learned that the only way they can make a profit is to alternate in letting one another through on the main path, an obvious solution. It seems so. But now, let us introduce the element of threat. We'll take two new subjects this time and give Acme a gate. By closing his gate, Acme can prevent Bolt from going through on the main path. OK, ready? Go. As soon as one side has a weapon, it is used. The gate slams shut. Deadlock. Time ticks off, and so does money. In the last few trials, they finally began to cooperate. Bolt backs up and reluctantly lets Acme through. And Acme lifts the gate. But perhaps the one-sided situation is unfair. If both were equally armed, couldn't they reach an agreement more quickly? Let's give Acme and Bolt each a gate and see. OK, ready? Go. Deadlock. Disregard of mutual interests. The issue is no longer finding an agreement. The issue has become saving face. Profits? There are none. Only losses, the heaviest suffered in any of the games. It's significant that the capacity to retaliate is not necessarily an advantage. In this game, Acme lost 61 cents, and Bolt lost 64 cents. Looking back, we see that only in the no-threat condition, where neither player had a gate, did anyone make a profit. But you might feel that there's a catch. If only the players could talk to one another, wouldn't they reach an agreement more easily? Let's give them an intercom and find out. OK, ready? Go. Again, the first move is to use the weapon. And they do communicate. Uh, say, your gate is closed. Uh, I know it's closed. <coughs> well, well, that's not very fair. Well, it is if I can win. Well, I'm going to close mine then, too. On that trial, Acme lost 46 cents, and Bolt lost 51 cents. OK? Ready? Go. Next, they try bargaining, but fail. Say, would you back up and let me go through first? Well, you know, I'm losing money, too. Why don't you let me go through this time? 
Uh, well, if you don't let me uh, go through first, I'll just close the gate again. No, I can't see it. Looks like we're going to lose money on this one, too. Yeah, looks that way. Well, I guess we don't uh, trust each other. On that trip, Acme lost 61 cents and Bolt lost 64 cents. Okay, this will be the last trial. Ready? Go. And finally, communication deteriorates into words. Words without meaning. Without the power to achieve anything for either one. And so, they accept the pattern where each goes on losing. We're supposed to talk about something. Well, where, where are you? Where are you now? I'm at 10. There's much to talk about, though. I know what you're going to do. Well, I've done it. I think I'm going to lose less than you are this time. Well, that's probably because you uh, reversed a little earlier and closed your gate first. Yeah, well, I can only do that because I, uh, you're pretty predictable. Uh, you're pretty predictable yourself. In this game, Ackley lost 65 cents. Bolt lost 76 cents. We have seen that it is dangerous for bargainers to have weapons. When threat is involved, the energies of both players go into saving face rather than into making agreements. We have also seen that communication as such is not enough. If we are to resolve our conflicts at home and abroad, we must learn to give up communication patterns that have failed in the past and find new ways of speaking that heighten the awareness of common interest, words that work for rather than against mutually beneficial agreements. For the psychologist, the proper study of mankind is man. For the social psychologist, it is a study of man in all of his complex and interwoven relationships. Through scientific study, we seek to add to the knowledge of ourselves and of mankind generally. These studies are work in progress. Science never ends. Theories change, new facts emerge, research goes on. But this is the excitement and challenge of psychology, and in some measure, the possibility of an improving world. This is NET, National Educational Television.